Well, welcome to this CUBE conversation. I'm John Furrier in the Palo Alto studios for the CUBE. I'm your host so here with Jeremy Burton, who's the CEO of Observe Inc. Just launched their product. They launched their company before that. They're doing great. Jeremy, great to see you. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, always great to be back on. Yeah, there's there's certainly a lot going on. There's sort of my day job, which is running Observe, and my night job, which is uh, obviously working with uh, Snowflake. And it, it's sort of great to see both going on at the same time. You've done very well with the Snowflake relationship, being a board member and all, and being in that ecosystem. And a lot of people are doing well in the shift. You're part of it. Again, you're on the inside, but also now on the outside, building a business. And it's exciting because it's highly competitive. It's a big category and it's really moving fast. So give us a quick update on what's going on in the landscape um, and your recent launch you just had. Yeah, I mean, I, I think most businesses, be the you know new businesses, cloud native businesses, as we call it, are born in the cloud businesses, are old. Um, they're, they're really uh, trying to deliver like new services to reach customers. And it, it's harder for an incumbent business because they've got to do a lot of reinvention or modernization, or I guess the term de jour is, is digitization. Um, and, and ultimately a lot of that means writing, they've got to start writing software again. You know, comes naturally maybe to the newer companies, uh, the SaaS companies, uh, but the biggest of the big have got, you know, really got to start writing software again. And and as they push a new code into production every day, uh, they got to make sure it works. And so the, this new market for observability, I think really uh, helps people troubleshoot problems with this, you know, these new applications um, and and the, the goal obviously is to make sure that, you know, you avoid customer churn and any kind of a bad experience, which um, I think is what every SaaS company dreads. Um, you know, it's a big problem. You know, getting all these metrics in one place is really key. I want to get into your launch 2.0. Yeah. Uh, if we could bring in Dave Vellante, my co-host with theCUBE, always a favorite to bring on the analysis. I know Dave dug in heavily on the launch. Dave, good to see you. Get your- Hey guys, how you here. doing? How you doing, Jeremy? Thanks. Good, Good to see you. Man. Yeah, John. I mean, the, Jeremy, the, your your first launch was was really a, a company launch, right? right? And now now you're giving the, the the product update. So what do we need to know? Yeah. So we. I mean, you're right. When we first went out, it was sort of like this is Observe and this is what observability um, is. We we sort of glossed over a lot of product details because I think like a lot of startups, we you know we we had a chunk of initial functionality, but we knew there was a lot missing, and so. So feverishly, you know, in the last six months since we did that announcement, we're now trying to, you know, fill out the product. And a couple of the big features that we knew we needed, um, I mean, one was metrics. Um, and although we've always been able to ingest metrics, uh, most people maybe know, you know, time series type data, we hadn't built all of the functionality, you know, in our language or in the user interface for the user to be able to manipulate them. Um, so that was a big lift, um, which we got done. And then, and, and very closely related, once you've got metrics, the next thing people want to do is they want to start alerting on things. Hey, hey, tell me when this metric is is out of whack. And one of our sort of big differentiators or one of the things that we always uh, bring to bear on any kind of data we manage is, is, to, is to link data together. So we're always trying to provide more context for the data that the user's looking at. So metrics and alerts, they sort of tie into our core value prop of being able to relate data. Jeremy, if I don't mind, you don't mind ask, uh, answering, I'd like to get your take on this because one question I ask all these analytics companies is, yeah, data's great, data lakes, and it's all good about getting the data in this kind of environment, but yeah. most people just want to shape the data and they want to just get insights out of it fast. They don't want to, they don't want to, um, do a lot of prep. They want to have it in position, whether it's querying mm -hmm. it or just having it available. And sometimes it's not always there. So they're constantly reshaping it. And so mm -hmm. the idea of just shaping it and making, getting some insights, which is basically quickly distill out of it, turns into, I got to reshape. I got to go back to the well, if you will, or the lake in this case, um, and yeah. pull out the data. How are you guys solving that? Because this is like the, um, the simple construct, make it easy. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, even going right back to data warehouse in days of old, the big frustration is is ETL, right? It, it was so painful to transform the data into the right shape to get it into the database. I mean, some of these projects. I mean, I, th I think like seventy percent of those projects never even completed. Um, the the big big difference now, and, and certainly a lot of the data we deal with is it's, it's unstructured inherently. It's generated by machines. We, we we just sort of dump it all into Observe, and then we let users 
pause it on the fly. And so it can be one shape one day and a different shape the next. And then we'll, we'll backfill all of the data automatically into the new shape that the users define. So these systems have really got to be set up to do um, like ad hoc analysis. You know, when, if you only did a couple of updates to your application uh, a year, the, the environment wasn't that dynamic. It didn't change very much. And, and most of the problems you saw, you, you, you've seen before. And now with code changing every day, the application looks different every day. So the issues that you see look different every day. So it, it's really, really important that these systems are incredibly dynamic and don't get locked into one particular shape from the get-go. Jeremy, you, you took a somewhat different approach. I mean, a lot of the companies in this space will choose to do like a purpose-built database specifically for observability and metrics and so forth. And that, that's talking about a heavy lift. That could take, take many years. You're choosing to put your emphasis, do your heavy lift elsewhere yeah. That obviously gives you a time to market advantage. Can you talk a little bit about that philosophy and what that gets you? Yeah, it was probably one of the biggest decisions that we made when we founded Observe was, was do we build our own database? Like almost everyone who'd gone before, um, or, or do we go with a commercial offering? And um, when we first started building against Snowflake three years ago, we, we, did, we weren't actually sure it could do what we wanted to do. And so it was one of the biggest areas of technical risk. Um, but certainly at this point, we've got ourselves very comfortable that it's going to be able to do what we need it to. Um, it saves us building a database. And uh, I mean, like this week at the Snowflake Summit, I think Snowflake just announced an additional 30% compression on data. It, it's like, okay, so we did nothing. And now, you know, all of those folks who are sending terabytes a day to us, they get an extra 30% compression. And, and so that's the value of building on a commercial platform. You know, Snowflake has got 300 engineers working away on on their database and they deliver benefits to us and we focus on the application. So we know, obviously Frank, we talk to him all the time and he's unequivocal about your cloud. We're not doing a halfway house, we're not doing on-prem, but you're, I'm sure familiar with the, uh, the A16Z narrative from, from, in, uh, from, from Martin Casado yeah. and Sarah Wong. Basically the premise for those of you who don't know is that you know, for startups and as you're growing, cloud yeah. is a no brainer, but at scale, it becomes 50% of your cost of revenue, it becomes uh, uh, an albatross to your operating leverage. What do you think about that? Do you buy that? Uh, do you ever see like a snowflake going going back on prem? What, what's your uh, thoughts on that? I mean, I feel like, yeah, I mean, we used to put wells in our back gardens and generators <laughs> in our basement. And you know what, they're, they're cheaper too, right? If, but the problem is I've got to dig a freaking well, right? And, and, and then what am I not doing while I'm digging my well? And, and so I, I don't know, I, I, I mean, I get the general premise, but I don't want half the company going and building, not just like a database, all of the infrastructure that's underneath. Why? Because it's not what our customers pay for. Like if we can add more value on top of that platform, we can charge more. So it, it, it's sort of like, well, if all those companies had actually started out building their own infrastructure and everything, would they have, would they have built the application experience that made them successful? I mean, you, mm -hmm. you so the the I mean I I get the paper and I think it's very very well written. I'm just I'm just not sure it's a big distraction. Like we don't care about the underlying infrastructure. We just want it to be there. Yeah, you Dave. know, and, and you know, and if we were doing that, then we might observe might not be as good as it, it currently is. You know. Well, I think it's a question to me, John, is where's the customer value? Is the customer value in you know the valuation of the company, or is it in what you can deliver and how fast you can well, deliver? Hold on, let me just put context to Martin Casado's little thing there. It's the paradox <laughs> um, paper. So there's a paradox there, and his thesis is: Do you focus on cost of goods sold, or do you drive more revenue? And his whole part point was: At some point, you got to look at the cost, right? And and I then weaved into him. I, I hit him up on Twitter immediately, and I said, "Oh, so you must have a bunch of companies who aren't growing, right?" So. Um, <laughs> So, because the, if you look at what's going on, the McKinsey paper, we covered this at our last startup event, um, startup event is that the companies that are driving new revenue is coming from a lot of replatforming and refactoring, but also net new use cases. So a lot of clients are making more money by introducing new products. So, so that's a new revenue. So you are, you are either going to be on one side of the paradox. You're going to be inside of, I'd rather refactor for new revenue. Yeah. Then, save money by reducing costs. So I, I still think we haven't cleared the runway on this growth. So I think there's plenty of trillions left to create. So I, I'm sure. on the side of, I'm on the side of, you know, if you're worried about pennies in the cloud to the well point that Jeremy mentioned, then you might either look at other things. 
Yeah, it's about growth. I mean, I feel certainly younger companies and and observe and I mean also Snowflake that we were just talking about. I mean, uh, the Snowpark announcement this week of going and running Spark jobs. Well, yeah, they could do that, or they could go build a data center. I mean, to reduce yeah. cost. And yeah. to, mm -hmm. to me, um, the, the right call is to do more with customers' data. Um, and and the, the the I don't know the the somewhat. Um, I mean, the counterpoint to that would be, well, let's make it a more profitable business. But, you know, to, to me, that doesn't add up for the majority of new companies. Jeremy, so, Jeremy how should we? Uh, let me ask you, how should we think about this space? Because because you have, you got guys like Splunk that have been doing log analytics for a while mm -hmm. now. You got you got the Elk stack coming in with an open source, and you know it's 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 open source, yeah. but it also brings complexity. You got big players now like Cisco who's made, you know, the the acquisition of AppD. You got kind of who's now a legacy and new relic. We talked about purpose-built databases before. So everybody's coming at this from all different sides. How do you think about it, look at it and, and where do you fit? Yeah, I think you've got the big players. I mean, you've you've named a, quite a few of them then. And 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 look, most of my career I've I've been on that side, right? And and typically what you do as a big company is it's harder to innovate and so you use your balance sheet for innovation you go buy innovation and and then you try and integrate and um that that uh, i mean it's very very doable and um but it just takes a long time and the risk is that as you integrate you, you're never really getting your architecture on a solid foot and you're sort of band-aiding things together and we're selling multiple things to the same customer versus really coming back to first principles and saying, well, how should this really have been built? So I, I actually tend to worry a little bit less about the bigger companies. Um, and then look, there's a set of startups that have uh, from like observed from first principles thought, well, if we were to build a system to, to look at all the telemetry data that applications and infrastructure generate, then, then how would we do it? Um, so, you know, we, we certainly are banking on the fact that the more modern architecture, um, as time goes by, because I still think we're, you know, we're in, the, in in baseball terms, we're probably in the first inning still um, of observability. Um, that that modern architecture will will come to bear over time. We'll be able to do things that the other guys won't be able to do. And and one of those is actually the simple task of relating data. You know why? Because all of our data is in one place and it's in a relational database. You yeah. know, it's it's that simple. I think one mm -hmm. of the things that's worth calling out and pointing out is that you guys are also on the snowflake, so you. You're riding that wave to your point about, I, I, which I agree with, by the way, you're in, you're focusing on innovation, not kind of moving the deck chairs around on stuff. But I want to get a, a question about this event you had, because one of the things that you guys are becoming known for is to eliminate the headaches for SREs and DevOps engineers uh, who have been conditioned to accept, you know, the old ways of kind of handcrafting. And you know, the people who do it first tend to be the most bloody when they when they come out of it. But as it becomes easier, right? And we, and we discovered this at the Red Hat Summit, Dave, and Jeremy is that this notion of an SRE is becoming more prominent in engineering schools and computer science programs as kind of a replacement for IT. I don't mean like IT is dead, but like IT is turning into AI ops, GitOps, whatever people want to call it, it's cloud native. So the notion of an SRE is on the teams of these modern development teams. So you're seeing this end-to-end -end workflow visibility. So, you, so that means that if they're going to have that, they're going to have these new team members, SREs and dev and sec together, and they need the data. So this is where you guys are. And I think you guys hit this and correct me if I'm wrong, if you don't mind explaining, how does that, the observability equation change when the teams yeah. change? Because teams are changing in yeah. the modern architecture. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's 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 probably a cliche, but the, the you know, there's tooling and then there's process change. And as, as, as people move to things like continuous delivery, um, they get maniacally focused on uh, delivery of, of new features and new capabilities to the customer and then focused on the experience that the customer's having. And I think the, the you know the, the role of the SRE becomes critical because they try and understand not just what the customer is doing with the application, but the problems that the customer is experiencing. And that's got to work hand in glove, you know, with the engineering team who ultimately is going to implement the new features that the customers want. And one of our sort of big missions here is to is to lessen the burden on the DevOps team, which has been providing essentially the infrastructure and tooling for the, for the SRE and engineering teams to use. R right now, they're overwhelmed to deliver the, just the basics, and and candidly, the engineering and SRE teams are not not happy with what's been delivered. So if we if we can lighten the burden on the DevOps team, 
you should then get a richer experience for the SRE and engineering teams for them to do ultimately what they want to do, which is customer satisfaction and, and engage the customers uh, in, in new ways. And, and there's just the quality of what is surfaced to those teams right now is just not very good because it's hard. So Jeremy, you mentioned the first innings, you, your uniforms are still white. <laughs> you, you, you got the starting pitcher on. How's it, how's it feeling? How's the arm feel? What's the early customer interactions like? Where are you getting traction? Yeah, it, it's it's been interesting because um, you know when you start with no customers, I mean obviously I, I, we've got on the wall here at work our first customer, twenty five hundred bucks, and I've never been so thrilled to to get a sales <laughs> order for twenty five hundred dollars. Um, but no, it, it, it's we, we've targeted largely SaaS companies uh, or tech tech centric companies, and and one of the guys that we're, we're going to be highlighting is uh, Top Golf, which. Um, uh, I'm sure anyone who's been there and, and you know enjoys going and hitting a golf ball around and playing Angry Birds. But um, look, they're a tech-centric company. Um, customer experience for them is everything. They're not in the in the IT business per se, but IT enables them to deliver these amazing customer experiences. And so, you know, when they've got issues, when they need to troubleshoot shoot problems, they need to do it quickly. And and so we tend to you know help those kind of companies um, improve the experience they're providing. Um, but yeah, we've got about 20 paying customers so far. Um, it's, it's, it's very different actually getting a customer paying you money versus a, a sort of friend or family member saying, yeah, I'll give that a whirl. Um, you know, it certainly sharpens the point on the feedback and, and really that's what we need right now. I mean, I think every startup strives to get to what we call market fit, which is can we sell this product repeatedly to thousands of customers? Um, I don't think we're quite there yet, but we certainly have got the volume of customers and the feedback coming back to engineering that that you know can get. We know what to build, put it that way, to get us to that point. Well, smart what you do when you're starting with the SaaS companies, the service providers. You, you, so you're not you know you're not jumping off the cliff into the enterprise for every custom right. deal. You know, get the product market fit, and then understand the retention, and then expand your TAM from there. Yeah, yeah, you try and build a solid foundation and you, and you know when you go to the enterprise, you're going to need features like role-based access control and more of the manageability uh, capabilities. But, you know, if you were to build all of that out first, then you wouldn't know whether you've got a compelling experience for an SRE or an engineering team. And so what you tend to do is, is defer a lot of the management type capabilities, try and build compelling features. When you see the features are compelling, then you sort of build out the supporting infrastructure that allows you to go to bigger companies. So it's, uh, I mean, it, 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 I mean, it, 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 the enterprise is why I've always dealt in sort of enterprise software is it's, it's not easy. Um, and, and my old boss, Joe Tucci had a, had a great saying on this, like, you know, if you're in a hurry, take a bit more time. And I think that that's sort of our mantra right now. We're in a hurry, everyone wants to go, but like, if we don't get the product right, it, it'll, yeah. it'll bite us later. Yeah, the, old, all, the other expression in the enterprise is everyone makes it all complicated and everything. It's all comp too complicated, um, which is the enterprise. If it's not complicated, they make it more complicated, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah. welcome to the edge no, too. No, there's every, huge, there's every edge case you can think of, which is why you've got to be careful early on because we, we can't afford, we don't have time to deal with edge cases. We've got to deal with, you know, what's up the power alley. And then once we've got that going, then you can start to deal with more of the edge cases. Yeah, we're in the same boat on our end too. Jeremy, I'd like to get uh, to end the segment here by giving a quick update and recap of uh, the event real quick and what you guys are doing as a company and, and what you did at the launch and where your sweet spot is. What are you looking for? The, what's the type of customers that you're looking for right now? What is that power alley that you're focused on? Yeah, three to 4,000 SaaS companies in, in North America is where we're after. Um, and we tend to uh, help folks on uh, more efficient troubleshooting of applications. We help them with tool consolidation um, and we help them with security audit and compliance. So there, if you like the, the key use cases that our, our initial customers have, have brought us into. And um, yeah, we started off really focusing on, on logging and log analytics. And then, you know, yesterday we added to that, you know, the metrics, the time series, data analysis, um, and also the alerting. And, and we, we've also got really running in house the, the more APM like visualizations around tracing. So maybe a little bit of a hint at what's coming in later this year. Yeah, I want to get your thoughts too. There's been some commentary on Twitter, like, you know, we want to get things simpler, a little bit more calmer. 
I think there's a comment like, it's not the mid, we want more of the Midwest vibe, not so much the, <laughs> the coastal elite, Silicon Valley, shiny new toy. Yeah. Um, what, what's your take on that? Because it's culturally the shift, people want to reduce the tools. I mean, they got the tool shed of, you know, every single tool that's been shipped, every company comes out is selling a tool. Don't be the yeah, tool, don't be a fool with a tool as the, as the expression yeah. says. No, no, if we're not careful observability, we can define it to be this niche thing. And, and, and you know, in Silicon Valley out here, it's, it's probably the worst because there's almost this attitude of, well, I'm not sure you're smart enough to do observability. You're, you're doing it all wrong. <laughs> and our approach, I think, and I think the market in general wants, like they, they've got issues and, and our approach needs to be, well, give, show us what you're doing today. Give us the data that you're generating today We'll make that better and then we'll show you where the blind spots are. And so you can have a much more iterative approach to get into that desired end goal. But we've got to stop defining observability as almost this, this niche that Silicon Valley companies uh, use. I mean, I, I always joke that we want more of our customers watching Netflix, not listening to engineers from Netflix explain observability. Yeah, David, called the flyover enterprise now. It's a new category of enterprise. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I want to encourage people to go check out the, the, the launch. It's, I presume it's up on your website, Jeremy. Yeah. But so not the typical mumbo jumbo. You guys have a lot of fun. You started off, you're like, what? And it's, it's just, it's pretty hilarious. And then, you know, you get into the meat of it. But yeah. so good job on that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we had a local San Francisco comedian, uh, Annette, help us out. She was awesome. I think, yeah. and I think it's been a software engineer at, at uh, SurveyMonkey back in the day. So. Right, right. Always great stuff. Jeremy, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for the update and uh, we'll see you around. See you in real life soon, very soon. Great, thanks Jeremy. guys. Always a pleasure to be on. Okay, it's theCUBE Conversation. Yeah. I'm Jeff Roy. Dave Vellante on analysis on this CUBE Conversation segment. Soon will be in real life. We'll be at Mobile World Congress for our first physical event in a long, long time. First event since 2019 for Mobile World Congress. A lot has changed since that time and we'll be on there for the first hybrid event. And then we have two more hybrid events coming up as well. ADF's Reinforce as well as ADF's Reinvent. Cube Virtual and Cube Physical all together. Stay with us, thanks for watching.